This is a Magicka Necromancer uh, PvP healer support build. Uh, we'll just talk about the, the non-CP setup here, uh, but there will be links in the description for uh, the non-CP and the CP setup. Uh, and I'll also do a, an alternate gear selection as well, because the, the gear in this build can be kind of difficult to get a hold of, um, so I'll, I'll have some, some options there. And the idea for the build, so flavor-wise, um, my idea for a, ne a magic and necromancer, when I think of how they would support their allies, um, the way I think they would primarily go about doing that would be really by weakening and hindering their enemies. Uh, and so that's kind of a big focus of this build. There's a lot of very powerful debuffs and crowd control and ways to just generally make life miserable for, for any enemies that are nearby. Uh, and then at the same time, we have these massive, like, through-the-roof heals as well. Um, so our, our allies are taking way less damage, and then the damage that they do take, they're, they're recovering from it very quickly because we have all these heals going around. Uh, and so I think for those reasons, it's actually an excellent build uh, for this patch uh, because, you know, this patch damage is way, way up uh, and healing has been nerfed at the same time. Uh, and so you can make life a lot easier on your allies by having this build around because you're, you're like I just said, you're reducing a lot of the damage that they're taking in uh, and you're giving them an overabundance of healing. Uh, plus all the crowd control and stuff, it really, honestly... For a healer build, this feels like the most abusive build that I've ever played as a healer. Uh, even though I'm not really doing much damage at all, but just you can see any enemies that are nearby, they're just struggling against all this CC and they're weak, they're doing hardly any damage. Uh, and it's just, it's a real struggle for me. The race is Argonian, mainly for the extra healing done, and I'm also using the Ritual Mundus Stone uh, for even more healing done, and that's kind of a consistent theme throughout the build. We're just going to be stacking that healing done stat uh, as high as we can. For the consumables, I'm using just regular Tri-Stat food and Spell Power potions. Uh, and for the stats, uh, again, I'll put a link to the UBSP build uh, in the description uh, so you can take a look at the stats there. I will just mention, you'll notice that the spell damage is very, very low. And that's because we're not investing in spell damage whatsoever uh, in this build. Uh, anywhere where we would invest in spell damage, we're instead investing in healing done or magic or recovery. That's, that's the focus here. So it truly is uh, strictly a support and healing build. So it's a Mighty Chudan uh, Mending, aka the Healing Mage set, uh, and Critical Repost. So it's just a classic 5-5-2 setup. No mythic items, no arena weapons, or anything like that. Uh, but the, the gear can be pretty difficult to get a hold of. Uh, Mighty Chudan uh, drops from the final bus, boss of uh, Veteran Ruins of Mazatum, the DLC dungeon. Uh, the Healing Mage set comes from Ethereum Archive, which is a 12-player trial in, in Craglorn. Uh, and Critical Repost is a, uh, a Cyrodiil crafted set. Uh, if you happen to be uh, in the Aldemary Dominion, then you'll have a pretty easy time getting a hold of this. Otherwise, it could be hard to get a hold of because it is located deep, deep, deep in AD territory. I'm using five light, one medium, one heavy. All seven pieces are divines. Uh, and we can get away with wearing seven divines really easily because of this critical repost set. Um, so the two through four piece bonuses of this set alone give you enough critical resistance so that you don't need to worry about uh, critical resistance at all anywhere else in your build. So you don't need any M-Pen. Uh, remember, our characters were given uh, base critical resistance this patch. Uh, so just with that and the two through four pieces, we have more crit resist than we had last patch already. Um, so we can just stack that divines, go seven divines and pump up that healing moondus as much as possible. Uh, and then the five piece bonus on top of that, um, when it procs, it reduces your enemy's critical strike chance and critical damage uh, by 10%. So even more critical mitigation. Uh, and this critical mitigation applies to the rest of your team, right? Because it's a debuff that you're applying to that enemy. Uh, so they're going to be they're they're going to be critting less often, and their crits are going to hit less hard, no matter who they hit. Uh, so this is basically eliminating the crit bonuses that Nightblades, Templars, and Khajiit get from their from their passives. You know, so if you're fighting against one of those people, you're just straight up removing one of the things that gives them an edge. Um, it's a very easy proc with a really high uptime, um, and the cooldown is per target. So you can have this debuff active on multiple targets at once. Um, so it's a really, really great set. Um, 
Mighty Chew Dan, we've talked about this before. Uh, this is just a really great set on any character, on any build that you feel like you have too many things to juggle, too many timers, too many cooldowns you're trying to keep track of. That is absolutely the case on this build, I can tell you. Uh, so having, uh, not having to worry about an armor buff, just getting that at all times from Mighty Chew Dan and it's just always there, I can just forget about it. It really goes a really long way, especially, you know, your armor buff is really important. You, you definitely don't want to let that drop off. Uh, and the fact that I can just forget about it and, and just know that it's there and I can just focus on keeping my team alive, keeping my enemies debuffed, keeping my crowd control on the ground. Um, big fan of Mighty Chew Dan. Mending, aka the Healing Mage. So the five piece bonus of this set, whenever you cast an AoE healing ability, you reduce the weapon damage of nearby enemies uh, for 430 for three seconds. Now, uh, three seconds is a very short duration, but with the right rotation, you can keep a pretty high uptime very easily. And we'll talk a little bit later about exactly how to do that. Um, and 430 weapon damage reduction. I mean, that basically negates the damage bonus uh, of New Moon Acolyte for stamina builds. Uh, and it is worth noting that the, the debuff uh, does not apply to spell damage, so it doesn't really affect Magicka builds. Um, but this set only has a 10 meter range anyway, and the biggest threats that are within that range are probably going to be stamina brawlers spamming dizzying swing. So the people that it matters for the most, it's applying to them. The jewelry, all three pieces are infused with Magicka recovery glyphs, uh, and then the weapons on the front bar, I'm using a charged frost staff with a frost enchantment, uh, and on the back bar, it's a powered resto staff with a weakening enchantment. So we'll talk about the skill bars. Um, so on the front bar, the main two abilities that you want to focus on are Wall of Frost and the Remote Totem. These are your two main CC abilities. Uh, and basically, these two abilities combined give you complete ownership over whatever piece of ground you happen to be standing on. It belongs to you and no one can take it from you. Um, Wall of Frost will snare your enemies, it'll slow them down, uh, plus it has a very high chance to apply the chilled status effect, uh, so that's going to immobilize them and apply minor maim, so again, further reducing the amount of damage that they're able to do. Plus we're using uh, the charged trait uh, and a frost glyph on the staff, so that even further increases our chances to apply that chilled status effect, so it's nearly guaranteed. You put that Wall of Frost down on someone, they're going to get that chilled status effect almost every time. And so combined with the fear totem, uh, all nearby enemies are getting snared, immobilized, maimed, and feared on cooldown. So they basically, they just don't want anything to do with that and they'll almost always back off immediately. Uh, and that's when you and your team turn and push and keep pushing into them and keep dropping these AOEs on top of them. And you're basically just keeping them on the back foot at all times. They can never kind of get a leg to stand on and you just maintain the upper hand the entire time. That's why I say that it feels downright abusive even though you're not really doing that much damage. Uh, it, it, you're creating this kind of disaster zone situation where your, your enemies just don't know what to do. Another important ability on the front bar is Blast Bones. Now this is an offensive ability uh, and it doesn't do a ton of damage because we're not really specced into damage. Uh, but this along with the Flaming Skull, it can serve as a good enough deterrent if someone tries starts trying to focus you. You know, once they realize that you're pretty hard to kill, plus they're having to deal with all this CC you're throwing around uh, and you're throwing a little bit of damage at them, you know, a lot of the time they're just gonna say, you know what, Never mind, uh, and just go find someone else. <laughs> so even though it's not much damage, the fact that it's any at all that you're just throwing back at someone uh, is, a, is a pretty good deterrent. Uh, but the real reason for using Blast Bones is that it generates a corpse. And we'll talk about why that's important in a minute, but basically you just want to have corpses around, right? If you're a Necromancer. Uh, and then Race Against Time, of course. It's a Magicka build, so it's got to have Race Against Time. That's, that's my rule. It gives you Major Expedition and Snare and Root Immunity, both in one low-cost skill. Uh, it's just the most valuable skill in the game for a Magicka, build, for a Magicka uh, spec, in my opinion. Um, so definitely, and especially for a Necromancer who has zero mobility otherwise, uh, I think that it's absolutely not optional. You've got to have this ability. On the back bar, we have Braided Tether. Uh, this, is a, this is an ability that consumes that corpse we just made to provide a strong AoE heal over time, and it's free to cast. As long as you have a corpse around, um, you can cast it, uh, and it doesn't cost anything. 
Um, it also, just by having it slotted, it gives us an extra 3% healing done. Uh, and so that's on top of our uh, Argonian passive, our Ritual Mundus, our Healing Mage 4-piece bonus, our Powered Resto Staff, our Curative Curse passive. Uh, it's a grand total of 45% bonus healing, basically at all times. Uh, unless, you know, maybe you don't have that Curative Curse passive active, in which case it's 37% bonus healing all the time. Uh, we also have Illustrious Healing, Radiating Regeneration, and the Intensive Mender. These are your uh, heal over time abilities, and you basically just want to try to keep these up at all times during combat. And as long as you do, your teammates are basically going to have a very difficult time dying. I did want to talk about the Intensive Mender specifically for a second. So if, if you're ever in a situation where it's like a panic emergency situation and you need to you need to cast some ability and you're trying to prioritize what's the most important ability that I can that I can cast right now, it's your Intensive Mender. That's the one that you want to have active all the time, no matter what. It basically tosses out the equivalent of a breath of life every two seconds. Uh, it's a it's a smart heal. So it just automatically targets whoever needs it, and it, and it gives them this huge burst heal. Uh, it costs very, very little. It also can serve as a body block. Uh, if it's between you and somebody trying to target you, they can hit your mender instead. Um, so it's a really great, it's a really great ability. I love the fact that I can just, I can summon it and then just go line of sight or go pay attention to something else and just trust that that mender is is looking out and doing work. Uh, I also have Resistant Flesh, and this is my main burst heal, uh, and I say main, uh, which implies that I use it a lot, but I really actually hardly ever use this ability, because the, the heals over time uh, are so strong, they're usually sufficient, and by the time I'm thinking, like I'm, I'm reaching to cast this ability, oh, it's too late, they're already full of, full health now, so I don't, I don't actually need to cast it. Um, but once in a while you do need it uh, to bring someone just from the, the brink of death. You do need to, to have a really strong burst heal. Uh, and this is a really, really powerful heal. When you're fully buffed, the tooltip is like around uh, 11,000 or so. Um, so really strong. Uh, and then we're using the Resto Staff Ultimate uh, Life Giver. And that's just our emergency bailout. Uh, give us a second chance if your team is about to die or even just like one person is about to die. Um, this one ultimate right here basically guarantees that they're, they're going to stay alive at least for a few more seconds, especially if you have your Incense of Mender up at the same time. They're getting that on top of it, and they basically just can't die. Um, so as I mentioned before, there is a bit of a skill rotation. And, you know, of course, in PvP, it's not always possible to pull off a perfect rotation every time. There's a lot going on, a lot of in-the-moment decisions you have to make. Uh, and for like damage builds, we don't even really call it a rotation, right? We usually use the word combo instead because it's a more like accurate description. Uh, but this build actually does use a fairly set rotation uh, to make sure that we're applying all of our hots and CCs on cooldown and just to make sure that um, the, uh, our debuffs has as high, uh, a high an uptime as possible. So it might not always be possible to do this exact rotation, uh, you know, depending on what's going on. But in general, you should always be trying to kind of default back to this sequence as much as you can. So you'll start on your front bar and cast Blast Bones. And that's just to make sure that you're going to have a corpse available here in just a few seconds. Uh, then you lay down your remote totem and your wall of frost. Then swap to the back bar and cast Illustrious Healing. And that's going to be the first time that we proc that Healing Mage debuff. Then we cast Braided Tether to consume that Blast Bones corpse we just made. Uh, then we summon the Intensive Mender, and at this point that Healing Mage debuff is already about to expire. So then we cast Radiating Regen uh, to refresh it. Uh, and so these are our two abilities that proc Healing Mage. It's Radiating Regen and Illustrious Healing. Those are the two abilities that we have that will proc this set. Um, and so that's why they're kind of spaced out in the rotation, just to make sure that we're refreshing that debuff at a, at a nice consistent interval throughout the rotation. And so, yeah, after you cast Radiating Regen, just flip back to your front bar and start, start over again with Blast Bones. So I'll just do a recap of that just to kind of make it a little more concise. So you start on the front bar and do Blast Bones, Remote Totem, Wall of Frost, Flip to the back bar and do Illustrious Healing, Braided Tether, Intensive Mender, Radiating Regen, then start over on the front bar. So really not that hard with a little bit of practice, uh, it, it can be pretty simple. 
Uh, and if you need to do a heavy attack to restore some resources, I recommend doing that right after uh, Illustrious Healing. Lay that on the ground, then do your heavy attack right before you do the, the Braided Tether. Um, and also wanted to talk a little bit more about Critical Riposte. The idea to get the most out of this set and to get the most out of your class passives, uh, you want to be up in the fray of combat. Uh, you want to go uh, find, you basically want to get hit with enemy AoE. That's your goal. Um, so you have plenty of heals to survive it, so don't worry about that. Um, it's not going to be a problem to, to stay alive. Um, and so what you want to do is, when there's a fight, don't hang back and try to heal your team from afar. Go stand up in that fight, lay your AoEs and all your heals down on the ground. Um, and you know, you think about, you have Stam Sorks with Hurricane, uh, or, or just Sorcerers in general with their, their Lightning form. You have uh, Dragon Knights with their Spiked Armor, they're going to be hitting you with that. Um, you have Wardens with their Sub Assault. Uh, you know, basically, almost everyone has some sort of like passive AoE that's going on all the time. They're going to be hitting you without even meaning to, and they're going to be proccing this debuff. Um, and at the same time, probably a lot of those things are going to be applying some sort of negative effect to you, like the burning status effect or fracture or something like that. Uh, and so that's going to proc your curative curse passive and increase the amount of healing that you're giving to your team overall. So, you know, it seems counterintuitive, but those are good things. You want to be, you want to be getting hit with the AOE. You want to be getting those negative effects applied to you. You have more than enough healing to survive it. Uh, and your team as a whole is going to be benefiting from it. I think that brings us to the end of my Magic and Necromancer PvP support build for the Greymore patch. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have anything you'd like to ask or share, feel free to leave a comment or email me at ketsparrowhawk at gmail.com. Until next time, good luck out there.